We live in an era when faith in so-called liberal democracy is at an all-time low. Given the cynicism, secrecy, born to rule manipulations of our political class, and not to forget their dalliance with the economic elites, none of this should surprise us. The fiction that liberal democracy is a reflection of the will of the people, or that our so-called political leaders represent the interests of the electorate, or indeed that they are open and transparent, is so removed from reality that it's almost laughable. <laughs> the liberal state has, since its inception, always been prone to deceit, mischief and unwarranted secrecy. Vital information has long been hidden away or buried under obscure pieces of legislation for reasons of national security. We frequently hear the same rationale in totalitarian states. Such reasoning is, of course, largely bunkum. It mostly serves the interests of the powerful empires and colonizing powers have always engaged in this stuff, as does our own government which denies public access to information on refugee movements because of operational reasons. And yet, as we all know, secretive clandestine measures are designed not simply to deny access to vitally important information. They are calculated, above all, to conceal what the powerful get up to behind closed doors. It takes the likes of Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward Daniel Ellsberg, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manon, John Pilger, Julian Assange, and countless other journalists and whistleblowers to prize open the lid of secrecy and state manipulation. They are heroic figures, not criminals. They are indispensable to any decent functioning democracy. However, as is becoming increasingly clear, there's often a heavy price to pay for such brave actions. In Ellsberg's case, after releasing the Pentagon's top secret report on the Vietnam War, known as the Pentagon Papers in 1973, he was charged under the Espionage Act of 1917 and faced a maximum of 115 years in prison. Following the release of classified information from the National Security Agency, CIA employee Edward Snowden also faced a lengthy period of confinement for having apparently breached, yes, you've guessed it, provisions in the Espionage Act of 1917. Ellsberg escaped prolonged captivity while Snowden sought exile in Russia. Perhaps, not surprisingly, the Espionage Act of 1917 has once again been wheeled out to shut down another dissenting voice. This time, journalist, publisher, and founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. It has done so in cahoots with the Ecuadorian and British governments and supported in its usual obsequious way by our very own administration. It's an ugly, cruel, and arbitrary application of brute power designed to intimidate journalists across the world. This is no accident. The systemic abuse of journalists and journalism is on the rise globally, including in Australia. <laughs> Julian Assange's groundbreaking journalism has been widely recognized, and when it suited them, supported by elements of the mainstream media. He is an award-winning journalist who has taken on the most powerful entities on the planet, beginning in 2007 with posts relating to the US's treatment of Al-Qaeda suspects held in Guantanamo Bay. In 2008, WikiLeaks published emails from the Yahoo account of Republican Vice President, President Aspirant Sarah Palin. But the proverbial hit the fan in April 2010, when WikiLeaks posted a classified US military video of an Apache helicopter gunship firing on what turned out to be innocent bystanders. 18 people were killed, including two Reuters journalists. In June of the same year, Bradley Manning, later Chelsea Manning, was court-martialed for leaking combat videos and State Department documents. In July of the same year, WikiLeaks went on to post 75,000 classified documents, among them data on civilian casualties inflicted by the US-led forces in Afghanistan. As the heat rose on WikiLeaks in late 2008, 
Allegations of rape and molestation emerged in Sweden, but WikiLeaks didn't flinch. In October, it posted 400,000 classified military documents called the Iraq War Logs, which reported, among other things, the torture of prisoners of war by Iraqi security forces and civilian death tolls were much higher than previously thought. Many other posts followed, including millions of diplomatic cables from US consulates around the world, the Guantanamo files, Syrian government files, files relating to private negotiations on major international trade deals, leaks from the Saudi foreign ministry, posts of NSA documents showing the US spying on its allied leaders, leaks from the Democratic National Committee, leaks on CIA hacking and surveillance programs, leaks of Russian surveillance operations, and so forth and so on. In the interim, of course, the US administration had fixed its intention, attention on putting Assange and WikiLeaks out of action. In 2008, Assange was arrested and placed under house arrest by the British judiciary. In June 2012, fearing extradition to the US, not an unreasonable assumption, as it turns out, Assange took refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, where he was granted political asylum and later citizenship. He was to spend seven long and often grueling years inside the embassy. The US ramped up its intention to criminalize Julian Assange with the threat of extradition looming even larger. Few, if any, human rights lawyers or even former CIA operatives believed that Julian would receive a fair trial. For a variety of self-serving reasons, the new Ecuadorian government turned the heat on Assange and eventually, in April this year, he was forcibly removed from the embassy. We now know some of the elements of the main story since then. Assange was thrown into a London dungeon, otherwise known as maximum security in Belmarsh prison, placed in solitary confinement under a disproportionately harsh, harsh sentence. He was vilified publicly by politicians, the mainstream press, and the British judiciary. <laughs> in prison, he experienced conditions which his father describes as beyond obscene. Assange's access to the prison library and a computer was restricted. He had no access to the internet and was denied full access to the provisions and information needed to defend himself. His health, both physical and psychological, has deteriorated rapidly. Julian's father, John Shipton, a quiet and courageous man, has given enormous support to Julian yet has seen his son suffer tremendously in confinement, both in the Ecuadorian embassy and in prison. The deliberate cruelties inflicted upon Julian and the pro prospect of extradition to the US, resulting in possibly long-term imprisonment, have been very difficult to bear. But John has not only offered support and comfort to his son, he has also spoken out about what the treatment of Julian signifies particularly in terms of its implications for independent reporting and democracy itself. The threat faced by Julian Assange is designed to curtail the right of journalists to hold the powerful to account, and therefore for secrecy, dirty tricks, murderous intent, and duplicity to remain undisclosed. We should all be very concerned by this not least by our government's unwillingness to protect and indeed bring home one of its own citizens, to allow the cruelties inflicted on Julian Assange to go unquestioned and to collude in his ongoing suffering bring shame to our nation. It's something, <laughs> it's something none of us should ignore because ultimately each of us will bear the price when the powerful are given free reign, that's the road to totalitarianism. Fearing for his son's future, John Shipton has shown extraordinary dignity and courage in the face of brute power. For this and many other reasons, we honor him here today. Let's please give a really big Mullumbimby welcome to Mr. John Shipton. Kieran 
Riley is a member of the Catholic worker community and the Plowshare movement. He has spent two years in prison after the ANZUS Plow shared action, disabling a B-52 bomber in New York, and also for his activism in the Second Iraq War. He has been a prominent defender and organizer of rallies for Julian at the Ecuadorian Embassy and at Belmarsh Prison. Please welcome to the stage, Kieran O'Reilly.